I think most Muslims don't experience the Quran as a book. I think it, there's a very atomistic sort of exposure to the Quran. So it's either bits and uh, pieces, bits and pieces, yeah. like you got a little khutbah here about something or a small video here about mm-hmm. something, or somebody posted about a single ayah somewhere. And so it's this disjointed set of wisdoms and, you know, r- you know uh, uh, beautiful pearls from the Quran. But you're not looking at it as a book. You're looking at it as a, as a collection of individual wisdom. أَفَلَا يَتَدَبَّرُونَ الْقُرْآنَ أَمْ عَلَىٰ قُلُوبٍ أَقْفَالُهَا بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Welcome to a special episode, an opening episode, a preview episode of the Divine Book Club podcast and I have with me some very special guests uh, Rather I should say that Sheikh Fahim here is not a guest but a co-host with me in this program and this is your podcast in which we are going to be reading through the entire Qur'an. We're going to be sharing some very light and easy reflections, extracting some lessons, and sharing in a journey of connecting with Allah's Word, understanding, pondering, and sharing as a community across the world. So in this episode, inshallah, we're going to share some ideas and tips about how to engage in this journey of reading the Qur'an in a language that we understand. And I'm very privileged to be able to introduce two very dear friends. And it's a privilege from Allah that I'm able to have friends in Qur'an, right? Uh, One time Ustad Norman has shared a post in which he called me his Qur'an buddy, which is one of the nicest titles that I've ever... One of the nicest titles that I've ever uh, been addressed by. So these are uh, special guests who have traveled to be with us for this podcast. And Sheikh Fahim, I have known since 2005. Uh, I pulled out, would you mind grabbing this uh, DVD? We pulled this out from the archive, something that we did back in 2005, an event in Edinburgh University at the Festival Fringe. And Sheikh Fahim was there as a young reciter at an event where we were showcasing the beauty of Quran recitation. And in the midst of that, of course, talking about the message of the Qur'an, we had these screens, if you remember, where we are broadcasting uh, a translation of the Qur'an so that people, whether they be Muslims, non-Muslims, the general public, we're letting them hear the words of the Qur'an directly and uh, have some appreciation of what the Qur'an is talking about. So we would select some different themes and that's something that, alhamdulillah, uh, we built on uh, since that time. So that was under the name of uh, Qur'anika, that was the organization that was running at that time. And Ustad Norman, around the same time, was taking the first serious steps for Baigina Institute. Yeah. Uh, Ustad Norman, I'm sure, is very well known to many people uh, watching this um, and has been a mutual friend since Fahim. You went and studied for some time and participated in the Dream Program as it was campus based in Texas uh, back in those days. Uh, we also shared some time in Egypt at Al Azhar University. That's right. You reminded me that I used to uh, stay in your flat and apparently I snore. I don't know. Maybe. Maybe I do. Um, so we've had this time at Al-Azhar in Egypt and then uh, here in the UK and different parts of the world where, again, due to Allah's uh, absolute generosity, we've had the chance to travel to different places, talk to people about the Quran, listen to people, share ideas and to grow some different projects. So. Sheikh Fahim, of course, what's your title at Quran Reflect? So, um, Head of Community Empowerment, that's, um, I mean, that's the fancy title. Um, in rea- the reality on the ground is that I'm uh, encouraging other, the community online to reflect. Um, we try and give feed- feedback to uh, users who uh, post for the first time and who are getting to grips with uh, posting their thoughts about the Quran. Um, so I, I take a lead on that as well as um, producing content on Tadabbur for um, the online readership. So Tadabbur being a word for reflecting on the Qur'an, right? So QuranReflect.com, um, this is an initiative that was taken by a number of brothers and sisters who, who wanted to have a platform where people can share really their personal perspectives about the Qur'an. We have on there, obviously, Ustad Norman has an account there. You have 
some of the sort of prominent teachers and, and famous people and uh, scholars. But you also have accounts for just anybody from the general public. And my experience uh, working with Quran Reflect, and let's hear from your experience as well, but I, I tend to find that sometimes the most interesting insights come from general members of the public. Yeah, I agree with you. It reminds me of a proverb uh, in Arabic, um, which says, قَدْ يُجَدُ فِي النَّهْرِ مَا لَا يُجَدُ فِي الْبَحْرِ You can find, sometimes you can find in the river what you can't find in the ocean. Or for in this so the ocean in this is the yeah. uh, the scholars and so on, and the, and the river might be seen as lesser because it's just uh, you know next to the sea it is it looks small, but there could be some insights that you can get from there. Yeah, because tadabbur a lot of it is based on personal experience. It can be how a person experiences a certain verse, um, and you know th there are. It's not an academic exercise per se, and it doesn't rely on a. I mean, of, of course, you can have a mufassir or just tadabbur, but his tadabbur will look somewhat different to a, you know, to a lay person who does tadabbur. You know, one person is looking at it from the perspective of his life struggles, for example. Um, you know, one of the things I appreciate yeah. about Quran Reflect is that people can post a reflection. And you have people like Fahim, Sheikh Fahim and Sheikh Suhaib and others that can sort of guide that because if their contemplation is going in a direction that's kind of not in line with the meaning of the ayah and they have somebody who's more seasoned in Quranic studies that can actually steer that, maybe give alternative suggestions and kind of fact check also uh, a little bit, which is, I know the, the double itself is subjective, but it needs to be based on a proper reading of the text and it's very possible that somebody misread or read something into the ayah that wasn't there and so i think the mechanism that's been created in quran reflect is very helpful because people can often you know, there's a lot of culture um a lot of different cultures in the muslim world um discourage engaging with the quran because you're going to get misguided you're going to just end up misinterpreting right so now we've got two things we, we on the one hand we want everyone to reflect on the quran and on the other hand, we don't want them to be misinterpreting the Qur'an. And how do you balance these two opposing forces? I think that's why Qur'an Reflect is such a valued service, is because people are reflecting, and they have a kind of a safety net of somebody seasoned in the study of the Qur'an saying, hey, okay, what you're saying, yeah, that makes sense. Or that's actually a genuine insight that can work with this ayah. Or here's why it doesn't work, you know? So with, the, with Quran Reflect, obviously, you've got the idea that you can go on there and search particular verses and, and, and write about them. But there's a stage that we realize that we need to think about before that. And that's sort of where this current project comes in. Before you can start reflecting on the Quran, you've actually got to read the Quran. Right? You've got to open it up, whether that be in, in a physical format, whether it be through websites and apps. Yeah. And you've got to encounter the words of the Quran. And by doing that, you can then start to stimulate those thoughts and have something uh, to share yeah. or not. You know, it's okay just to, to read and to understand something and to walk away with something. Uh, so, Ustad Nu'man, in terms of what you've been doing at Bayina, obviously there are different levels in which you're trying to reach people. Yeah. You're trying to do some things which, let's say, are for uh, the broadest possible audience and then things which are for people who are more interested to go into depth. Could you share something about your thought process behind doing things on different levels? Yeah, I think I think the Quran has um, a variety of offerings to you know um, not just a variety of human beings, but human beings at different stages in their life, right? <clears throat> and the way people get exposed to the Quran, many of them will get exposed by way of just a single ayah, or by a single surah, or by a very small snippet of the Quran. Right, uh, some people's entire relationship with the Quran, and I, when I say relationship with the Quran, I'm not talking about recitation and memorization, and I'm talking about a meaning-based, a meaningful relationship, um, in the sense that it facilitates them thinking about the word. Right, um, that'll either come from, you know, uh, something they were curious about, so they'll search that subject matter maybe, or they heard somebody talk about a particular ayah, so they they didn't put make the effort, and somebody else was d driving that. Right. Um, my sort of perception is 
get somebody to think about the Quran, even if they they heard you know uh, from our work talk about the Quran for five ten minutes, at least it got them curious to want to know more, or to at least uh, realize there's more than meets the eye. There's uh, there's more to the, uh, than than what's on the surface reading of the book. There was a young man that came to me after this Ramadan series uh, just last night. And he said, I've so read you, the Quran. You've been teaching about striking examples in the Quran. Yeah, just right? the parables in the mm. Quran, right? Which is which is a loaded component of Quran studies, right? Uh, and it can leave a reader with many questions. So, you know, I, I, we went through these parables, and uh, this young man came up to me and said, I've read the Quran in translation, and I realize through this series that there's so much more there that I want to spend time to try and understand, right? So there was that. So that's one of my objectives. But there's another objective, and that's actually one of the things that, that really excites me about this project uh, that you've taken up with the Qur'an calendar and what we're going to be talking about here, is that I think most Muslims don't experience the Qur'an as a book. I think it, there's a very atomistic sort of exposure to the Qur'an. So it's either... Bits uh, and pieces. Bits and pieces, yeah. like you got a little khutbah here about something or a small video here about mm-hmm. something or somebody posted about a single ayah somewhere. And so it's this disjointed set of wisdoms and you know, r- you know, uh, uh, beautiful pearls from the Qur'an, but you're not looking at it as a book, you're looking at it as a, as a collection of individual wisdoms, right? Mm-hmm. And you know, one of the objectives, one of the ways that the Qur'an should be experienced by everybody is actually as a book. It is a book, right? And um, and at the same time, its individual or smaller components have this remarkable beauty to them that that deserves attention too. So there's this tension between the, the bigger picture, looking at it as a book, and then zooming in and the, mic- the macro and the micro, right? So this macro approach of, okay, you know what, I just, I just want to be able to read through the entire Qur'an in, in, a, in a rich and meaningful way. Um, that is something that is still a major obstacle for most people. And I think it's a major obstacle because when you're engaged in, let's, because I, I did it myself when I first tried to study Quran, just read a translation and let's just go through it. Uh, and even getting through Baqarah was a major, major struggle. I was reading the Yusuf Ali translation and I was re- trying to read it every day and I would get through 30, 40 ayat and I just zone out and say, what's going on here? I don't, I don't, I'm not getting it. I'm not, there's something I'm missing. And I was really trying to pour into the, the text of the, because I didn't have any access to the Arabic. But there, uh, and, and, and that's when I realized I need somebody to help me kind of make sense of this. Or at least I need to start documenting my questions as I re- read the text and have some kind of an, a mechanism where I can get those questions answered. Right. So you, you've done something which is called a concise commentary. And yeah. Sometimes you describe it as like a flowing translation, almost like it's a translation, but with just a little bit of extra context. A little bit of footnotes, yeah. Um, and those are generally those are kind of uh, audio video series that you can find on the TV, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, so I think it's, it's along a similar kind of idea that what we're doing here is trying to create a situation in which we are reading the Quran, um, creating. The, the cultural context for individuals right, at home to read the Qur'an, but at the same time trying to provide some extra help yeah. in, in what you were needing at that moment. Um, and so, you know, I want you to hold that thought about Surat al-Baqarah because, of course, Surat al-Baqarah is the first thing that we'll be reading after the right. Fatiha. And um, I'd like to get later in the episode your tips as to how, you know, uh, those who are watching this, and then we, as who, who are conducting the episodes, how can we make it? Um, you know, how can we actually open those doors for people? So, of course, we are actually recording this in the month of Ramadan. So these cups are empty. <laughs> <laughs> it's all for show. Um, but later on, inshallah, there will be some some tea that flows. And while I'm sitting here with uh, some of the young people who are uh, sharing their perspectives, but of course, Ramadan is very famous as the month of Qur'an, Ramadan, we all sort of do some extra effort. We we have also institutionally, um, all the Qur'an institutes do something as a special like Ramadan program. What can we share during this month? But then of course, Shawwal comes around, right? For those who don't know, it's the month after Ramadan, right? 
So you've got another 11 months until Ramadan comes again. So one of the things that we have been pondering on is how do we make use of the entire year, right? right? So Ramadan is always going to be Ramadan with its own special flavor, its own special activities. I like to call it the festival of Quran, right? Everyone is participating. But then Shawwal, of course, you know, there's, there isn't an, you know, a ready-made answer as to what do you do right after Eid? Okay, Eid, we're partying, we're having a good time. What do you do the next day? Right. So I sat down with some of uh, my colleagues and, and team and we thought about, okay, how many weeks do we have between one Ramadan and the next? There are 46 weeks. Okay. Coincidentally, there is a hadith that says that dreams are one forty-sixth part of prophethood. So the word 46 <laughs> is in a hadith, but we didn't yet figure out how to connect these. But maybe there is some deep uh, that, connection that, that here. That was a nice try. We'll think, we'll think about it, right? <laughs> <laughs> so there are 46 weeks. So you know how in the in the, uh, the Arabic Mus'haf, in the copies of Quran, we have these 30 parts, right? Right. So these are sabara or juz, right? So 30 parts, what's the rationale of that? To facilitate reading the Quran in 30 days. It doesn't mean we're all doing it that way, but that's that was yeah, the thought process in, in, in creating the 30 divisions. It wasn't a... It wasn't a division that came with the revelation. Right. The revelation came with ayahs and surahs. Mm-hmm. And the companions also had their own uh, practice of reciting the Quran sometimes in seven days. So they had this idea about the seven manzils of the Quran. You know, uh, if, if you know about it, they say, Fami bi shawq. Right? So, yeah. Fa is for Fatiha, Mim is for Al Ma'idah, the next one. And then the Ya is for Yunus, right? And then the Ba is for Bani Israel, Surah 17. And then Sheen is for Shu'ara. And the Wa'u is for Wasafat. A bit of a cheat one there, but Asafat. Eh? And then the Qaf, Surah Qaf eh, onwards. So these are all divisions of convenience, right? To yeah. facilitate and encourage reading over a time period. So just to head off anyone thinking, though, you did an innovation or a bid'ah. Well, only insofar as uh, others have done it. We divided the Quran into 46 parts for weekly reading. Weekly reading, excluding Ramadan, right? Because Ramadan, you probably want to just do something with the whole Quran, right? But in between, very, very simple proposition is let's read the Quran in a language that we understand. Yeah. Let's read the Quran in a language that we understand. Now, if that language is Arabic and you understand Arabic, then you are in the best of all possible worlds, right? right? Read the Quran in Arabic and you understand it. If not, then you're going to need to reach for something. You need to reach for a translation. Yeah. And although I think that people often do know that there are translations of the Quran, they often have copies of the translation at home, there hasn't been till now, as far as I know, any kind of system in place that encouraged the reading of uh, translation of the Quran. Right. So that's where we got the idea for the global Quranic calendar, right? So now we can find it at quran.com slash calendar right quran.com slash calendar here and i showed you this earlier we've got the uh, 46 weeks are kind of just designated and this is the reading for a particular week and in this week all you have to do is you know you can use the website you can use your own copy of the quran at home you can use any app uh, you can use what we send you we'll send you also uh, if you subscribe on the site, we'll send you a PDF, all right? So that looks like this, right? So I think I showed you this before. Yeah. And a weekly reading, as you can see, is only, what is this, five pages? Maybe yeah. 3,000 words. It's very, it's a very short yeah. thing. So by reading that, you can... So five pages a week, just, just to hear that again, because that, that's important. Yeah. Five pages a week. So by doing that, you're going to get through uh, the whole Quran. And then... As a way of supporting that, we have this podcast, right? So we have this podcast, which is the, you know, we're going to have the reading one. And then Sheikh Fahim and I have also the weekly roundup where we go onto QuranReflect.com, QuranReflect.com, your site, right? And we're going to choose some of the best reflections that people have shared on that weekly reading and just share some kind of, uh, some general, you know, share the best reflections that we come across. Right, so I'm really looking forward to doing that, and so uh, taking it back to kind of um, 
underlining the importance of what we're trying to do, right? So this is just a human effort and one approach to doing it. But at the core of it, it's about reading the Quran. And you mentioned about reading the Quran as a book and encountering it, encountering it in that way. Yeah. Um, and having an individual relationship with the Quran also. Yeah. And with QuranReflect.com, we have the importance, of course, of the uh, of reflection and of, of the community. Um, you know, what's your experience really in, in the use of Quran translations as a way to encounter the Quran, right? Because wouldn't you say it has, a, you know, a lot of benefit, it has also some, maybe some limitations or some, um, drawback, some drawbacks? I wanted to understand it better because I had my own take on the challenges with translation from my own experience. But as I traveled with Quran Week, I started doing kind of an ad hoc survey. Hey, so when you read the Quran in translation, do you run into any challenges? And I asked this question around the world to different audiences. And um, you, get, you get a variety of responses, but they're the same variety. So even though there is a variety, the, there's a limited range of responses. And they have to do with, sometimes I don't know who the pronouns are referring to. There's a lot of he and they and you and who's the you and who's the they and who's the he and who's the, the we, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so I get lost in that sometimes. Um, sometimes I, it feels like I don't have the background information. Uh, sometimes I feel like what's being told is very partial. So I'm not getting the full picture of, let's say, a story or something. Sometimes things feel disconnected um, because it feels that it, it was speaking about one thing and just abruptly just starts speaking about something else. Um, other times it feels like it, there's, a, a, there's a redundancy like it's saying something, then it's saying it again, and then it's saying it again. So why is it repeating itself in this way? Um, and so, so this and other... You know what's interesting about that is, sometimes we talk about how non-Muslims, when they open the Quran, they might encounter some things that they don't understand. Right. We always talk about how non-Muslims might do this. Right. But you're talking about Muslims. I'm talking about Muslims. Not just Muslims, but Bayina. You know, uh, people, people want who, to know better. who, who come to a Quran week, yeah. they care that much about the Quran. And they're telling you that actually they find it a little bit difficult. And isn't that a little bit of a, a difficult thing for us when, of course, our message is go and read the Quran, go and read the Quran. But is it clear enough for the type of audience that we are talking about? So I think that, I think that the Quran was meant to be clarified. I think it was meant to go from hearts to hearts. I think it was meant, you know, because the, yes, you know, the, the print happened and publication happened and then translations happened and all of that is the way humanity moved forward. But, you know, like even in the ayat, like, like it's a human activity, right? So somebody internalized the message of the Quran and they're now delivering it to somebody else, and then they're delivering it to somebody else. And then, you know, even even in pl other places in the Quran, where Allah says, like, you know, these are these are signs for those who ask questions, right? Ayatul mm -hmm. It's almost like it's hinting at the fact that somebody engaging with this is going to run into questions, and they're going to have to have some kind of an interaction with those that they can ask those questions of, right? Mm -hmm. So there's this. There's, there's, uh, there are a few things that naturally emerge from a reading of the Qur'an. If you step back, okay, if I just assume that I have no background in the Qur'an studies and I've n done nothing in the last 20 years of the Qur'an, 20, 25 years, I'm just reading the Qur'an. What are some immediate impressions that I'm going to get? One is going to be, for sure, this requires more thought than I... For, if I really want to engage with this, this requires more thought than just a surface reading. That's, that's the first impression I'm going to get. The second is, I need to talk to somebody about this. Like naturally, it's going to emerge that I have more questions now and I need mm -hmm. to discuss this with somebody. But it's a right. good problem to have, isn't it? Right. So if you don't have questions about the Quran, you're not reading the Quran. Right. And this is, you know, you mentioned earlier that sometimes you've got maybe imams or preachers of some kind who are actively discouraging people from reading the Quran. Right. And I know I've said that recently in a podcast and people in the comments were like, you know, how could you possibly suggest that anyone would say that? Well, if nobody said it to you, then you're fortunate, but it does no, it's exist. very common. We've certainly encountered it. People come and tell me that they heard this. And to me, that sounds like uh, a cop-out, really. What's happening here is 
the person is saying, I know that when you read the translation of the Quran, you are going to have questions, but I don't want you to come and ask me because I'm busy or I don't know the answers or I don't want to get involved in that work. <coughs> For us, in terms of the work that we do, so the work at Bayina, the work at Quran Foundation and these various projects and many, many other Quranic projects that exist in the world today, our responsibility surely is to keep providing resources to people to facilitate yeah. their reading. So rather than saying, uh, well, you might misunderstand or you might not grasp the context that you need, my job is to provide you the context that you need, right? Yeah, so, so I mean, I look at it, at least from my perspective, I look at it as I really want to understand this book better. And I'm going to embark on a journey to try and understand it better. And as I'm embarking on that journey, I'm going to take you along with me with whatever I've come to understand. Uh, and that'll that'll help you because I'm not telling you that I've got it, but this is as far as I've got, <laughs> right? Yeah. And then it's kind of a, I think the, the Quran was meant to be a communal activity. It was it was meant to be a com communal engagement, and that's why even even the, the the scholarship history on the Quran is one of just multiple people and constantly taking from each other, like nobody's writing a commentary where it's just them. Everybody's taking from somebody else and saying, "Hey, they said this already. They did this. They helped in this piece. They said this. They said this." And they're even if they're saying something original, it's on the backs of so many others that have that have collaborated or they've used in, in, in going across that journey. And I think this is a modern rendition of that, right? At a, at not at a scholarly level, but even at a public level. Like the public's engaged with, you know, you know, anybody watching here is engaged with reading a translation of the Quran. They come up with a bunch of questions. They now have a mechanism to be able to ask those questions or even document those questions. And what would be really cool is you went through the entire Quran and you had a list of these, let's just say, unanswered questions, right? And as you engaged with the book, maybe later on in the book, some of those questions got answered. Or maybe through, by way of some of these podcasts, those questions got answered. And now you come back the year later and you still have those questions written down and you're like, hey, I already got that one. I already got that one. I already got that one. Oh, this one's still outstanding. Oh, now I have a new one, right? So it's a really, I think, uh, a really meaningful way of developing a lifelong engagement with the Quran as a book, which I think is a standalone part of our relationship with the Qur'an, separate from the other, you know, whether somebody wants to do a deep dive into a certain single subject or a single ayah or a single surah, that is its own, you know, entity has its own time and place. And I think a lot of that will naturally happen when somebody starts reading it as a book. If somebody might say, this surah particularly interests me, I just want to really get deeper with this one. Or this ayah, I just really want to know more about this ayah or something like that, right? So what you said is a more, uh, you know, it, it's it's clearer than when we typically just say, just read the Quran, the Quran is clear, right? Because it's a bit more complex than that, isn't it? Yeah. Um, if it were, it, it doesn't mean it's just simple, obvious. Clear must be something else yeah. in this context. Clear means that the, you have access through this to, to great meaning coming from, you know, the creator of heavens and earth. Uh, one of the things I, w I wanted to ask Ustad was in relation to uh, the commentaries that you're doing at Bayina. So you have the concise commentary. Yeah. Um, and that's pretty much like word to word. And then you're filling in the gaps. Yeah. Explaining some of the context brief, uh, briefly. But it's not the deeper look right. where you're, you're diving in, into some of the nuances and, you know, bringing up parts of rhetorical features and talking about those um, uh elements to a, to a greater depth is that would you encourage uh, the audience uh, and, and those who are studying the Quran um, and, and they're you know, they're new to it to to maybe progress from a co concise co commentary to then a more elaborate commentary is that is that how would yeah, you that's approach how it? I envision it I envision you should have a bird's eye view of the book first this is what you call Quran journey, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, Quran like, journey. Like yeah. Traveling through these layers. Yeah. And I, I think, I mean, my thoughts on this are still evolving, but I think that as I'm studying, you know, these surahs now in more depth, even myself, mm -hmm. um, I think, at least for me, it's, it's becoming more and more apparent that every surah has its own internal logic and has its own internal mechanisms. 
right? And I hopefully I want to be able to publish some works on just that. Hey, here's this surah. Here's what I think is happening as far as the internal mechanics of this surah. And kind of give you, before you even get into the surah, because right now we have Quran and we have commentary and we have translation. Yes. But I think there's, in the future, I think there's going to be genres of literature that are inspired by a better reading or a more helpful reading of the Quran um, that are going to kind of almost mentally prepare a student for what they're about to engage in. So it almost preempts some of the more obvious questions that they might run into and some of the helpful answers, maybe not all of the answers, but some of the helpful answers towards those questions. Like for example, your, your, you know, your audience, many of them inshallah will engage in this, in this calendar inshallah. and in the first month um, uh, inshallah, hopefully they'll go through all of Al-Baqarah, yeah. right? And Al-Baqarah is a plethora of subjects. It's, it's lots and lots of different uh, elements. And it's right? a hard place to start, isn't it? Yeah. Like it, so we could have perhaps created a system where you read the Quran not in its uh, book order. Right. Right. But the most natural suggestion is, well, let's read it from the beginning. Let's go from yeah. cover to cover. But when you do that, you're not necessarily getting the easiest introduction. Actually, I think, I think you're getting the intended introduction. I think that when the Quran was revealed, um, it was revealed to the Prophet ﷺ who was on a mission. So the revelations were coming pertaining to the objectives of the mission. Uh, that's why they were coming in an order that's not the final order of the Qur'an. So there's two divine orders. There's the order of revelation that was divine. And I genuinely believe that the order that the Qur'an is in now is also divine, but it serves a completely different function. It's no longer the prophetic mission which has been accomplished. It's now Muslim civilization. It's humanity. And humanity was meant to in, engage with the Qur'an this way. Like this is God's design. This is Allah's design for how He wants you to, how He wants to have this conversation with you. And He wants to start it with Baqarah. And to me that's, it's significant because, you know, for, for when you're speaking in terms of civilization, a sense of identity is crucial. And a sense of identity comes from your history, right? So um, in schools around the world, part of the government established curriculum schooling is national history <clears throat> because they want to indoctrinate, if you want to use the word, children into a sense of where they, they're belonging to this country, to this flag, to when they gain their independence, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. If, you, if you look at even Baqarah from that perspective, how did you get to this planet and you know, this, the, mm. the fact that you the were chosen? The story of Adam is there. The story of Adam yeah. right, at the, uh, right at the onset mm. uh, and then this, this process by which Allah, just the way He chose Adam of all creation, He chose the Israelites of all the, all, all the children of Adam. And now that, you, and, and understanding that history, now you'll understand why you've been chosen as an Ummah. And here's the charge that you've been given and how you are part of a history that is, that a crucial piece of that history is your father, Ibrahim alayhi salam. So you'll, you're going to encounter all of this. And it, by the end of Al-Baqarah, you'll learn a lot of things. But one of the things that you will walk away from is a sense of identity, right? And now your, 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 your place in the world, your place in, with, with Allah, your place among other nations, you know, your place within the nation, right? So, the, so you're, you're situating yourself. It's, it's giving you your bearings. And then from there you're engaging. So it's, it's actually, there's a building of the narrative and a thought process in the Qur'an that emerges. And that's, that's, that's what I mean by kind of the internal logic of a surah. And I'm kind of giving you a glimpse of a little bit of that in Al-Baqarah. But like, that's, that I think is something that uh, is still, uh, you know, under work. And people have, because you know, sometimes Makkan surahs, for example, they have very similar messaging, right? Mm -hmm. So you, you, you might, you can go, take the easy road and say they're, they're basically saying the same thing. Talking about the, you know, belief in Allah and His oneness and the resurrection <clears throat> and the hereafter. On past nations yeah. and, you know, a, a consolation. The warning of what's to, to come. Yeah, and a consolation to the Prophet, mm -hmm. and there's these five or six components and they keep recurring. So right? Al-Baqarah, of course, is a Medinan surah. Right. So now it is addressing the, the Muslim community as it's now been established. And I think that's a really, really helpful um, orientation to the surah. And in a way helps us to see like, what are we looking for? when we read it. Right. So as we're going to read through it, let's think about that, the aspect of identity, community forming. And I think actually there is an advantage then in reading it sort of quickly, 
right? Because that kind of yes. overview, bird's eye view. Yes. Because if you start to go into all the discussions about every ayah, you lose sight of the bigger picture. You lose sight of that. Yeah. So, so doing things in levels, that's kind of the the thought process of the Quranic calendar as well. Right. So we're saying to people, let's start with, you know, getting, you know, just the general picture. Let's journey through the Quran, and let's let that be the first time that we've done it. That's level yeah. one. And then we're still working out like what exactly is level two, how does it work? What is level three, how does that work? Yeah. But crucially here, and this is where, uh, I don't know if we'll have a little bit of attention here because you established an Arabic and Quran Institute. So the Arabic language needs to fit in somewhere. The question would be that where does it fit in? So do we start by learning, you know, obviously how to recite the Quran, you know, typically that is somewhere that we do start as uh, as, as children if we're brought up as Muslims. Right. And sometimes an emphasis is given on reciting, uh, perfecting our recitation and tajweed, maybe like your recent series uh, on, on YouTube about uh, the train how to beautify, yeah, beautify the voice and all of that. You know, this is the artistic side of things, you know, which we love as well. And then uh, sometimes people are focusing on memorizing, you know, maybe even memorizing the entire Quran. And the idea is that meaning will come along somewhere in this chain of events, right? At some point you will learn uh, whether learn the translation and the interpretation, or you will learn the Arabic language and go back and apply that to what you did. The logic that, that we're trying to build on here is, you know, if, if you're gonna start somewhere, start with the general meaning of the Quran. Mm -hmm. And then those other things, those are the completion, you know, those are the perfection. Right. Those are the ideal that we should also reach to. Right. Like we can learn the Quran in its own language and we should learn the Arabic language. You know, I think w one thing I really want your audience to hear is the Quran is a labor of love and there will be people that know more than you. They know Arabic and you don't. Their tajweed is amazing and yours isn't. They've memorized more than you have. Uh, they've read more than you have. They understand the commentary, the background. They, they you know. And, and you're just starting out reading a translation and you don't know you don't know anything right and you might feel almost inadequate until you reach a certain milestone and I think you need to do away with that sentiment like that has no place with uh, the Quran with one of the final addresses of our Prophet وسلم, to the lot, the massive gathering uh, in front of him was anni walo aya. Right, go go communicate on my behalf, even if it's when I all you al is is not referring to go give the entire Quran to everybody. It was even if you can give one ayah to somebody, and the idea is that if you embark on this, um, I keep calling a journey, but yes, if you do embark on this journey, then a, a a week spent in this journey, two weeks spent in this journey, these are meaningful weeks, and the, this is quality time spent with the Quran. The level of your advancement sometimes can become an anxiety-inducing, paralyzing concern. And you're not there, so therefore, what good is this? Mm -hmm. Right, so you start, you start almost uh, uh, minimizing and undermining the good that you're doing right now because it's not the amazing good that somebody else is doing that's 50 steps ahead of you. So like, you have to become extremely individualistic when it comes to your engagement with the Quran in that stop comparing yourself to people that are ahead, people that know more, people, you know, I want to, I wish I was that, I wish I was that, because you're, you're losing out on what is right in front of you. And the, the thing with that, the genuine advice I'm giving you is if you can let go of that need to compare and the feeling of inadequacy and just engage, just enjoy the, the, the step you're taking, the pace at which you will make progress will be shockingly much faster than anybody else, mm. right? It's a, it's a, Allah starts opening doors that you wouldn't have imagined because you let go of these unnecessary concerns, mm. right? So, and I think there, intimidation is a huge component of why people don't engage the Quran, right? So that, that's one thing I think should come across very clearly that a project like this one that is meant to benefit as many of you as possible so you can at least start reading the Quran meaningfully. You have to let your, your, your comparison, your intimidation, your anxiety, I don't know enough, I don't know everything, I don't know. You know, the, I, I met people that are seasoned Quran students that are like, I still don't know all the vocabulary of the Quran, astaghfirullah. Like, <laughs> stop doing it. What do you mean astaghfirullah? <laughs> like what does astaghfirullah mean? Right to <laughs> you know, so there's a question that, that yeah. came to me in, in, in talking about the Quranic calendar. What happens if I miss one of the weekly readings? Right. Right, so I said, then do the next week's reading. 
Right? So there shouldn't even be a sense of I have to do, you know, qaza, uh, you know, if I've, I've missed my prayer, I have to make it up. It's not like that at all, right? If You're making it, it not feel like a course. It's not a course. Like if you missed something, yeah, okay, unfortunate. And if you want to go back and uh, catch up on it, go ahead. Yeah, like, I'm, not, I'm not stopping you from doing that. But I'm saying, look, the idea is this week, this is our reading. If for whatever reason you didn't manage to, then next week, this is our reading. So read this one. Just take it easy. Yeah. Be easy on yourself. Don't, don't, don't it's feel a reading pressure. club. And you That's know, cool. yeah, exactly. And inshallah, you know, um, Ustad Father Suleiman, who has done a lot of stuff in Tadabur, uh, sometimes in Arabic and different languages, he, he tells me that those who join his Tadabur kind of uh, class, you know, they themselves are so addicted to reflecting on the Quran that, you know, if they missed their, their portion, they would start to feel like that gives them the anxiety, like, I need to be with the Quran, right? right. So I, I'm hoping that that's what happens, but let it happen naturally. Let's not feel that, you know, I also have to feel a certain way, I have to have a certain response, whatever. You know, we just make things so scary. Right. Mm-hmm. We also think that, you know, things have to be very advanced, you know. Right. Reflecting on the Quran, you know, some of my favorite reflections on QuranReflect.com are like, wow, this ayah is just awesome. <laughs> <laughs> you know, because that is some, this person uh, felt the awesomeness of this ayah and yeah. told me that he felt it by telling me that I'm reading his thing and I'm seeing it. Yeah, it is awesome. Yeah, you know, high five. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll give you a high five. Okay, there you are. Okay. All right. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> this guy. So then, uh, you know, just saying that, um, you know, that's enough, right? I, I don't need you to tell me about, you know, the, the, the etymology of this. That's your stuff, right? Etymology of this word. <laughs> <laughs> right? Or for me, قال <laughs> المفسر. You know, the, the, the scholar said, yeah. So all of this is is great, but it's not necessary for every person. And at the beginning, you know, we need to start somewhere. You know, we need to just get started and get moving. Well, one of the uh, discussions that Stad uh, was talking about, he, he referred to as the issue of intimidation of the Quran. And uh, the founder of uh, Quran Reflect is Brother Amir Abbas, may Allah bless him, true gem, uh, really humble guy, may Allah bless him. He um, talks about, so his entire approach is we need to remove the, a sense of intimidation, you know, that people typically have when they approach the Quran, they think it's beyond them and, and they. You know they're not worthy of accessing the Quran or even discussing the Quran or you know projecting their thoughts about the Quran to others, and so that that's one of the core objectives of Quran Reflect, inshallah. So he's he's yeah. not a scholar, and then he brought in yeah. scholars uh, or or you know attempted scholars like ourselves, and yeah. we we are you know supporting his work, yeah. but he's always keeping us grounded and reminding us like what are we doing here, yeah, right. So I'm I'm generally a, an intimidating kind of guy. That's what I do, right? Yeah. But then here, yeah, yeah thanks for, for those, disagreeing for the, with me. For those who no, don't no, know you, I think no. sometimes... But, but, but we need to actually be reminded accent. that, like, let's actually just bring things <laughs> to a level where... You, have, you have a judgment face that is... <laughs> I can judge you through walls. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I love you. It's, 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 especially, I just enjoy being in your company when you're giving somebody the judgment face. Like, uh, I'm hearing them talk, but I'm looking at your face. That's what I'm doing. I'm yeah, doing it right now. <laughs> Going back to the point. Uh, so... Um, I find the verses in Surah Al-Qiyamah very comforting for a student because the Prophet ﷺ is embracing revelation right. as a student and he is careful not to miss anything and so uh, and he's told by Allah Azza wa Jal that فَإِذَا قَرَأْنَاهُ فَاتَّبِعْ قُرْآنَ ثُمَّ إِنَّ عَلَيْنَا بَيَّنَا If we recite it to you through Jibreel alayhi salatu wasalam when we recite it to you then you follow it uh, you know and then um, follow its recitation and then upon us is its explanation. Yeah. We'll take care of making it reach people and making it clear for yeah. people. Yeah. Mm. Um, now, I, I guess it's actually the, unburdening. Yeah. The, the idea of itba' or the idea of like just following the structure of the Quran, I think one can even sense that in its meaning as well. Because a lot of people are like, where do I start from? What do I do? There's 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 tashaub and there are like you you start studying one part of the Quran and then you start thinking about other concepts and other things and khilafa and wilaya and all these other discussions and it becomes convoluted. The Quranic studies becomes convoluted. Whereas if you were to just follow the basic framework, the skeleton of the Quran. Um, then you find that there is actually an agenda there already in the Quran. Yeah. And I, I say that because I remember asking you, I said, Ustad, how do you set out you know, what you're going to talk about? 
uh, what is your structure like? What's the premise one, premise two, conclusion and natija? And you said, follow the ayahs, follow the follow follow the nizam within 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 the within the safha. And structure right, within the page. Structure within the page. Arabic? So this is what, inshallah, we're going to create an, like an app in the future. Yeah. That's plan. You replace all the English words with Arabic words. So then <laughs> it sort of teaches people the vocabulary. Yeah. And then you flip it back. You know, inshallah, it's something we could, we could, let's try to team up with, with Bayina. You're working on stuff like this as well. So, so we need to actually be able to bring people into the world of the Arabic language as well. Yeah. It's just something that, you know, it's not the starting point. Mm -hmm. You know, start somewhere easy and then later on you, 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 you People, inshallah, will have that keenness to, to go further, right? So after I've done level one reading, you know, I'm going to read it just the easiest possible translation that I have. So I'm going to ask you about translations in a second. Yeah. Right? So the easiest possible translation. And then uh, after I've done that, so this is what we want for every Muslim, by the way, level one. Yeah. Every Muslim should have had the opportunity to read the Quran from cover to cover in a language that he or she understands. Simple as that. That's, that's what we're trying to do here. After that, someone might say, I want more. I want to go further. I want to read with a bit of commentary. I want to start learning about the language. And inshallah, we'll run with you as a community. You know, we'll work with you to provide what you need, you know, to, to advance in that journey. But okay, I watched you in a podcast recently. I watch you sometimes. Okay, that's creepy. That is scary. No, that that is scary. scary. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, not while you sleep. I watch you sometimes on the, on, on podcast. And, and someone asked you about the best translation, and you said, our translation, but we only translated Surah Yusuf so far, right? So inshallah, we'll, we'll, get to, we'll get to more. But, you know, how do you suggest that a person goes about choosing a translation? Here I'm not asking what is the best translation, but I'm just asking how do you go about, or how should a person go about choosing a translation that they uh, can benefit from? It's a hard one. I mean, if we're talking about What's out there in English translation? Because you know, obviously, some some of our audience will want to read an Urdu translation, a Bangla translation, a Bahasa translation, a Swahili translation. So we I, we don't we have no insight into that world. Um, I have some insight into the Urdu translation world, but um, I think one of the criteria that people have sort of accepted for themselves is if it's easy English, it's a good translation. And I think that's a problem, uh, not because I'm trying to disparage any translations, but because just because it was written in easy English doesn't mean it was a good translation. It just mean it means it was easy English. Uh, it's it's good to know a, a translator's objective. Uh, some translators are making sure that you align with the theological approach they've already developed. So they'll add a lot of parenthetical notes to make sure you stay in line with what with they Islamic with Islamic monotheism, um, at, you know, at, as opposed to un-Islamic monotheism um, or Islamic polytheism. <laughs> <laughs> there is a particular transition that uses this phrase that we're referencing. Okay, right? okay, yeah. But but and then there are, there are other translations that are trying to capture the overall sense, and in doing so, they're compromising some of the nitty gritty of the language. Right, but they're still doing a good job of kind of getting the overarching meaning. Uh, there are other translations that are very concerned with, like I said, easy English, and in doing so, they're actually butchering the original meaning, uh, unfortunately. And they're doing a good job in some parts and bad in other parts. Uh, each and, and then there are translations that are pretty amazing. They're just in English that died a hundred years ago. Right, so you're not, it's great English, but it's just not your English, right? So, you know, um, and hast thou not seen it is gonna be hard for you to, to, to get through. So there will be challenges in translations, but I think uh, generally you'll, I think 80%, 80 let's see if I put a rough number out there, you'll get the idea of what's being said with some discrepancies here and there and that's okay. That's okay. That's okay. And, and you know, you don't have to say, well, I read it. You shouldn't develop the idea. I read it in translation. Therefore, that's what the Quran says. That's, that's problematic. And you shouldn't get develop the idea that, oh, I, I can't trust any translation. That's also problematic, <laughs> right? There's, there are human efforts. They have their limitations. The Quran happens to be an unusually rich language. So reducing an ayah to a statement, one, a one-liner, 
is next to impossible a task. So the translator had to compromise somewhere to get you that one line translation. I mean, the, the labor we had to put in to get through Surat Yusuf, we, yeah. we remember. And that's, labor of love. Yeah, labor of love. <laughs> but and, labor I'm, and I'm working on some other translation uh, projects at the moment as well. This one that we are basing off the tafsir of uh, Ibn Ashur, Muhammad al-Tahir ibn Ashur, and making a translation based on that multi-layers. And, um, you know, there's so much still to be done in translation, right? Yeah. But we should appreciate what is out there, right? So my own uh, PhD supervisor, Professor Abdul Halim, this is, of course, uh, his translation. We, we know this and appreciate as well. The, yeah, of the yeah. ones out there, I think my sense of his translation is he's trying to capture the overall meaning. And I think he does a remarkably good job at that. Uh, sometimes he does compromise the particular phrasings that are in the ayah. And you'll see that in the translation. But at least it's a starting point. So that's that was a starting point for what we're sharing in terms of uh, you know you the, said the, you the PDF, PDF that you get every yeah. week. Yeah. So yeah. We, we we use this translation as a starting point, and then we've adapted it more for the purpose that we're trying to achieve here, um, and you know, trying to maintain you know the way that he's gone about it, but adjusting certain things in terms of how you know. Mm -hmm. the, Something to do with the phrasing and how it connects to the to the Arabic uh, wording a little bit more as well. So, um, you know, we should appreciate whatever is there. And importantly, you know, we're not trying to get everyone to all gather on one translation. And as you mentioned, very importantly, people are going to be reading in different languages, mm -hmm. right? People are going to be reading in different languages. So, um, the important thing is to get the benefit out of what you have. Right, and then once you start reading it, sometimes you've got it on your shelf and you didn't didn't read it. Right, once you start reading it, you might say, "Okay, I might like to look for a different translation. Right. You know, I might like to try something else. I'd like to maybe have something that's got a few more footnotes than what I have here." Yeah, I do like. Uh, I know with, with with some people's uh, shoes with certain theological positions, with Muhammad Asad's footnotes are very nice. Mm -hmm. I think his etymology notes in his translation are very very nice. And they're, they're they're very helpful. Yeah, for a lot of beginning readers. So that would be. Uh, that's the kind of translation that, you know, those that give a, a bit more, uh, you know, context and notes and so on, that we would probably think about in level two to be promoting more. Now, of course, there's no harm in anyone just starting with that as well. That's absolutely fine. But maybe at the next levels where we start to say, let's actually encourage more reading of notes. Uh, but in the beginning, let's try to keep it as, as open as possible. Uh, I think the final question unless uh, Fahim wants to have a follow-up to this. But what I would like to ask you about is having a sense of the relevance of what you're reading, right? So sometimes when we're reading and when we're going to be discussing Surah Al-Baqarah, we will say things about what this meant at the time of Revelation and what this is talking about in historical events and, you know, relating it to the time of Revelation right. um, and, to, and to times before Revelation. Uh, what about the sense that, you know, we often say, read the Qur'an as if it's a message to you. Right. Is that something that comes easy or...? or, or, or... Um, a laborsome task, and I think it was designed as such. I think you can read the Qur'an at a surface level and just pass right through it and not stop and think. And I think the, the institution of the Dabbur that Allah describes in the Qur'an of contemplation and reflection is actually a call for someone to take pause and to stop and wonder why is God telling me about this story? Why is he telling me this detail of this story? What am I supposed to take away from this? And you're supposed to push yourself to ask yourself that question. Uh, and and what, what might one learn from, you know, and, and even in the context of Baqarah and generally in the Qur'an, let's just take one component of the Qur'an, storytelling, for instance. Uh, the stories in the Qur'an, let's say it's Ibrahim, in the, in the, the Ibrahim salam, lived well over a hundred years, right? And we, you and I have been speaking, the three of us have been speaking for almost an hour, I don't know how long. If there was a transcript of our conversation, it would be 20, 30 pages by now. Mm -hmm. we, we, we've been talking a lot, right? It's a lot of words. Uh, Ibrahim Alayhisam lived a hundred years. If you had a transcript of his life, that would be millions of pages. Uh, the Quran has maybe, you know, a um, handful of pages. Wouldn't even amount to 30 minutes of reading if you just collected all of Ibrahim Alayhisam in the Quran, right? So like the Quran then 
what I'm trying to get at is the Quran's highly selective in what made it into the final revelation. A lot was omitted. A lot of his life has been omitted in the Quran, and we've we've got glimpses into these moments. So if something made it into this final divine selection, then it's strategic. Then no detail is superfluous. Then everything is every detail mentioned has a significance. And we need to take pause and say, why would Allah, of all the things he could have included, and all the history that he omitted from the Qur'an, he wanted this moment in history recorded in the Qur'an for me. Right? When you, once, you, once you kind of reinforce and reignite uh, that mindset, uh, then I think your reading of the Qur'an entirely changes, actually. And that's just, we're just talking about the stories. Right? And there, there's, a, there's a mindset that one has to develop. When, when, if I start with the premise, and I do, this is Allah's exact word. When I say this is Allah's exact and final word, that comes with a lot of implications. And it's the, if I'm mindful of those implications as I'm reading the word, then I'm going to get so much more out of that than if I wasn't. You know, It's like, you know, um, just by way of analogy, if, uh, if you knew that the following message is the last time you'll hear from a loved one or something like that. Like it, it would create a sense of urgency. It would create a sense of why, would, why is this the last thing they wanted to tell me? Or why, like you're reading into the same thing that would have been otherwise a mundane read. Yeah. Now becomes the most important, you, you're like, you keep thinking about it over and over again. It's resonant, it's ringing in your head. Why? Because you know, there's a significance now associated with these words. And, you know, Allah sent us this revelation. There's a significance to these words. The Bible, by comparison, is multiple times larger in size than the Qur'an. And the Bible essentially is a collective historical memory, right? So it's, it's you, if you engage in the exercise of trying to find guidance in the Bible, by comparison, you're going to find a lot of historical data, name of this, name of that, this location, that location. And you're going to have to do a lot of, you might find some pearl of wisdom here and there somewhere as you go. But the Quran is not, oh, you might find something, a nugget here and there. Like every detail, every word, every phrase, every incident is significant for the purpose of guidance. Like behind all of it is Allah wants to guide me. Right? And that... That I think, you know, even if you're not reading any commentaries, just the way and the quality with which you're going to read your weekly reading of the Qur'an would just, it, it's completely transform. It's just the mindset with which you're reading it. Zakhir anything, any concluding words? No concluding words, just some uh, thoughts that you provoked whilst you were speaking, as you do, mashallah. Um, and that's essentially the... the the Qur'an, even to the layperson, anyone, regardless of your background, you will take something from the Qur'an, even if it's just a, uh, a, a basic reading of the verses. Uh, and I guess there's a question here as to, can someone who goes through the Qur'an calendar uh, and they go through the uh, translation, could they apply the five lenses that you both came up with? Um, should they apply it the first time round? Or should they apply it maybe the second or third time around? Um, there are certain things a person will naturally uh, glean, uh, you know, from the translation. So if they're reading in a linear sort of fashion, they're reading according to the chronology of the Quran. I think there are, like, they, they can definitely pick up things about coherence. I was just reading Surah Al-Tafifin, and Allah Azza wa Jal talks about Tatfif in the beginning of Surah. Uh, th these are people short, short changing people and short changing people transactions yeah but then there's the yum al hisab that comes after that and then kitab al marqum which is the inscri inscribed book of records where there's inscription um and so there's a clear contrast or there's a correlation between people who are who defraud others but they won't be able to defraud allah azza wa jal right. on the allah day is not the defrauding them he's recording accurately Allah's exactly. Mm. Uh, that's just a very basic extrapolation when you just read from the Quran. But it, in order for me to understand how to best benefit from the book, I need some loose principles, and I think I that's think where the five connections. I, 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 five. You know, that's cool. We have that video out there, that, that series out yeah. there on the five lenses. You know what my recommendation is? 
Just read and let your mind go where it goes. That's what I say. That's it. I mean, it's, I think a key word here is literacy. Mm. By literacy, we just mean learning how to read. Yeah. Right? We know how to read words, okay. But do we know how to read the Quran? Let's not overthink it in the beginning. Let's actually experience yeah, reading let's just the Quran. Experience it, yeah. By experiencing reading the Quran, we'll start to see, hey, I, I, I realize that I am finding this particular struggle or this challenge or something that I'd like to be able to do better. And then you find it and you find the resources. You can watch all our many, many videos and discussions and series and all the things that help. But at the core of it, let's just, let's just get started and let's get moving, right? So on that note, inshallah, after thanking my, I want to say, say two guests, our one guest, right? Jazakallah khairan, uh, <laughs> such an honor. <laughs> we uh, want to remind you to subscribe to this channel. If you're watching this on YouTube, subscribe to the Quran Reflect channel so that you'll receive more from this podcast. And very importantly, go to quran.com slash calendar, hit subscribe there, and you're going to receive notifications in that you'll receive your weekly reading, you'll receive a PDF of that reading, you'll receive uh, a reminder about this podcast and other things that can help you to think about what you're reading as well. Jazakum al khairan. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. أفلا يتدبرون القرآن أم على قلوب أقفالها